So today, we're going to be talking about something kind of controversial. It doesn't need to be, but it is. I'll talk about church and state. And how should you and I engage in our culture? How, how should you and I engage in our culture? Should we be involved with politics, not involved with politics? Who are you supposed to vote for? I'm not going to tell you all that right now, but what are you supposed to do in this election? I don't know if you guys noticed, but have you noticed that this has been kind of a contentious uh, election season? Uh, am I the only one that's noticed that? Yeah, yeah okay. How many of you love it in a fantastic yeah. Have you noticed sometimes people act like babies? Yeah, they kind of cry and make a lot of make a lot of noise and kind of go into a fit. In fact, I, I remember hearing a story of a man that was in a grocery store. He had his three-year-old son in the carriage, and the three-year-old son was having a fit. He was crying, grabbing things, going on and on and on. And and while he was doing that, he kept on saying, he kept on saying, Albert, it's going to be okay. Albert, calm down, Albert. Albert. God loves you. I love you, Albert. It's going to be okay. Breathe slow. Albert, breathe softly. Albert, it's going to be okay, Albert. And some woman was just so overtaken. She says, sir, I, I couldn't help notice how kind you are to your son, Albert. And the man goes, Albert's not my son. I'm Albert. <laughs> so I feel like Albert right now. I don't know about you, Right? What are we to do with all this? And I want to encourage you, God has answers for us. He has answers for us to intersect with our culture, how to make a difference, how to be godly men and women, how to vote appropriately, how are we supposed to do all this? And sometimes people think that, you know, that the church is, a, we believe in a theocracy. A theocracy is, a, is God is king and that the government is over that and it's with God. And we tried that after, uh, when, when Constantine and the Roman Empire merged with the church. That's when the church got adulterated and messed up, by the way. It doesn't work very well when the church and the state become one entity because one infects the other. And in fact, you can see that happening throughout church history. And even like, for example, when we began these uh, 13 colonies, became a, became a country, uh, you had the Church of England, right? You had the Church of England that was controlling. You had the Lutherans over the Germans and different places like that, and, and Roman Catholics, right, where it was all one government. And what happened when they came to the free world, they said, no, we don't want to respect of any particular religion. We want the free exercise of religion, free exercise of religion. In other words, you have freedom to worship the way you want to worship. And Congress shall not pass a law to have any particular church state, which is really a good thing. Next week, we'll talk more about the separation of church and state, what that looks like and what it doesn't look like and where that comes from. But today, I'd rather not deal with that right now. I like to deal with what the Bible deals with, and it's our hearts. Because out of your heart will flow the issues of life. If you deal with behavior without dealing with the heart, you're wasting your time. You're pulling a weed without getting at the roots. Today, I like to talk about the roots of political discord and how you and I can be different than the world. Does that sound like a good idea? All right, fantastic. Well, we'll look at that today. What is the attitude of our hearts? What's the attitude of our hearts? And, and the Bible has a lot to say about this. And, and by the way, what I'm about ready to share with you will revolutionary, revolutionize your, your wife and your life. Here it is. Know this, my beloved brothers. This is James speaking under the power of the Holy Spirit. What does it say? Let everyone, let every person, look at your neighbor and say, I'm a person. And so are you. Okay? Let every person, that means everybody. Okay? Let every person be what? Quick to hear. Slow to speak. Slow to get anger. angry. Have you noticed that we're slow to hear, quick to speak, and quick to get angry? Okay. Uh, this is a little thing that will help all your relationships, everybody. You know, if you and I will become quick to hear, I like what Francis of Assisi said. He said, may I seek to understand more than being understood. You see, the problem with us is we know from neuroscience that the mind can only do one thing at a time. People claim they can multitask. Not really. What you're doing is flipping channels as fast as you can. And when you flip the channel, you have the burn of that image or that thought that's, that's there starts to go away, but your attention goes to the next thing. And if you are so busy coming up with a rebuttal, you can't listen. 
And the problem that you and I have, at least I do, maybe you don't, maybe you're, you've evolved more than I have, but sometimes what I'll do is I'm from New York and I'm pretty quick on my feet. I like to come back with a good rebuttal and a little stinging remark and something funny, right? I get to do that. And so I'll listen to somebody and I'll come up with an answer. I'm not even listening to them anymore. I'm coming up with a rebuttal. I'm coming up with a defense of what they're saying. And the problem is we often argue over misunderstandings. So what we should really do, everybody, is instead of being quick to speak, we should be quick to hear. Let me get the information correct. Let me listen to the other person. Let me seek to understand. I was talking to a dear friend this past week who had to get involved with some kind of corporate training for things that are anti-God, and he had to do it, and he did it in a very wise way. What he did is he listened and asked questions like Jesus did. You don't need to give out your... By the way, I have news for you. You don't have to defend God. God can take care of himself. He's not looking for you to defend him. He's so big and so powerful, you don't need to defend God. Relax. Be still. Know I'm God. Don't worry. No one's going to take advantage of God. He's going to laugh in the end. So take a deep breath and listen. Listen. Quick to hear. And if you want to understand what that means is... Uh, today I'm going to treat everyone this Sunday. Uh, this is for, I didn't tell the ushers this or the staff this, but everyone gets a free Chick-fil-A dinner today on me, only today, that's it. Okay. They're closed on Sunday, okay. <laughs> but imagine you're like me and you go to Chick-fil-A on Monday, only today, only right now, if you're watching later on, it doesn't count. And I go to Chick-fil-A, and of course, they're very nice over there. Have you noticed how nice they are? Hello, sir. It's my pleasure. It's my honor. I'm so glad you're alive and breathing today. It's like, this is the best place. In the world. Yes, what would you like to have? Yes, I'll have, a, I'll have a chicken sandwich. You want a chicken sandwich? No, I want a grilled chicken sandwich, okay, without the bun. I'm, I'm one of these crazy people that order nuts, right? I want a lettuce wrap. So you want a bun? No, I don't want a bun. I want a lettuce wrap. Please include on there tomatoes and extra pickles with the grilled chicken sandwich. Do you want that with ch cheddar jack cheese? No, I don't want that. I just want the lettuce wrap with the tomato and extra pickles, okay? And I want a little mayonnaise on the side. We don't have mayonnaise. Okay, then give me the Chick-fil-A sauce because we know that works well, okay? And then also I want a large side of the waffle fries. You want to supersize that. No, I don't want to supersize it. I want, well, that's the same thing, isn't it? Okay, and I'll have a lemonade. So what do they do? They make sure that my order is received, that they understand it. Not only do they repeat back to me, but they put it on the screen. It's amazing, right? If you and I would do that with people, most of our problems and most of our arguments would go away. You know what they say that 60% of statistics are made up on the spot. So about 75% of our arguments would stop. <laughs> I'll make it 85. If we would do that, if you and I would just verify what the other person's saying, but it's impossible to hear what the other person's saying if you think you know what they're saying. Have you guys, do you know anyone that's a mind reader? Not only do they read your mind, but they know the motives of your heart. Well, I know why you did that. No, you don't. So, this is what we have to do, especially when you're married, especially when you have children, especially when you're involved with people, if you go to church, right? Quick to hear and, to, and ask questions and listen. Don't look up for rebuttal. Take a few moments. Quick to hear. Jesus asks questions all the time, okay? Slow to speak. You heard the old saying, God made two ears and one mouth, right? Okay, quick to hear but 10 fingers to type. That's a problem. Okay. Quick to hear, slow to speak. So I want to hear first. I want to understand what you're saying, what concerns you have. I want to ask questions to get clarity, just like the person does at the drive through All right? It's my pleasure. Okay? Then, here's another one, slow to speak, and what? Slow to get angry. And this is a tough one. So, Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to get angry. If you guys would do this in your relationships, if you're married, it would help you tremendously. I have found most of the time, I've said this before, when Sandra and I have a, a, um, conversations and discussions that have a little more bravado in it, usually the problem is I usually misunderstand her. Seriously. 
or she misunderstands me because usually her motives are perfect. Mine aren't, but hers are. I've learned to surrender. Okay. So quick to hear, slow to let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to get angry. Okay? For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now, this is just the ground rules for political discourse, whether it's with people in the church or outside the church. This is really, really helpful, everybody. Okay? And this is right in the Bible. I mean, this is, um, this is like amazing. People write books upon this and you make millions of dollars, and it's right there to help you out, written a lot better than any psychologist could ever. Okay, what is the attitude of our hearts? It's extremely important. Man looks at the outside. God looks at the heart. God loved David because he was a man after God's heart. God looks at our heart. So therefore, the Bible says, guard your heart above all else. From it's there, all your issues come from. All the issues that require tissues come from your heart. So why not make sure you and I have a heart check? When you go to the doctor, they check your heart. They check your rhythm. They check your blood pressure, right? They give you an EKG. Sometimes they do it. Why? Because the heart is essential. In your life, the condition of your spiritual heart is very important. And says in Luke 9, 54 through 56, Jesus was dealing with the heart of the disciples. The disciples were with Jesus. They were traveling, and they came to an area called Samaria. Samaria has Samaritans. Samaritans were the most loathed people, not loved, loathed people in the Jewish culture because they were half-breeds. They had parts of Judaism mixed with other things. They were hated. They could not stand them. If you think it's bad right now between Republicans and Democrats and cats and dogs, I didn't say that, did I? <laughs> You guys are watching too much news. Then, I'm telling you right now, it was a lot worse than that. They were at each other's throats. They did not like each other. So Jesus is walking through, and all of a sudden, the Samaritans were being, being, uh, making fun of them or not treating them with respect. We're not exactly sure what they did, but this is their reaction, okay? Here they go. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, he said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? just as Elijah did. They quoted the scripture, vengeance is mine, say of the Lord, and I will repay. Hallelujah. <laughs> they got all Pentecostal. They even had a little something in their throat. Ah, they had that going on. Lord, do you want me to call down fire from heaven? And, 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 you know, and, and they're quoting scripture. With righteousness, the zeal for the Lord has got my heart. I speak it like it is. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what does Jesus say to them? He says, but he turned and what? He rebuked them and said, you do, know, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. In other words, we're not going to get into this. We're going to go on. So be careful in the spirit you may quote scripture and righteousness, and I'm a zeal for God's house has got me. I'm a, I got righteous indignation. And this is wrong what they're doing. Okay, and you're saying all this, and you're barking, and, and oh, I got to stop talking about those types of things. But anyhow, by the way, let me just stop there just for a second. Uh, we got to be careful how we talk about each other. I just talked to Dr. Franco. Dr. Franco is uh, our missionary we support. He's from Haiti. He grew up in Haiti. He was an orphan. Uh, he came to know Jesus Christ. He became a medical doctor, practiced medicine. Now he's trying to go back, and he, we have an orphanage in Haiti. We're trying to reach people. We're trying to help his orphans. I spoke to him just yesterday. Hey, how you doing? He said to me, I got to be honest with you. I'm in, I, I'm, in a, I'm, in a, I'm in the backwoods of Georgia, and I'm a little afraid. Said, what do you mean? Well, there's a lot of stuff being said about Haitians right now, and I feel kind of, some of it's kind of funny, he said. I'm laughing at some of it, but some of it I, I'm really kind of worried about because People are looking at me funny when I go to the store. And, and he says, I just don't feel comfortable. I almost want to get out of the area and come to more metropolitan area like New York or something. Because up, up, down here in the middle of nowhere, we're in a, kind of a strange land. That's what he told me. Okay, now you and I don't know much about that sometimes, but he feels insecure because he's Haitian because of the rhetoric that's going on, right? Now, whether it's bad or good, that's what's happening. And so we got to be careful what we say. And, I, and, and he was even laughing about some of it. He thought it was funny. So that's funny, but this part's not funny. 
So we got to be aware of these things sometimes, everybody. Okay? So with the manner of spirit we're saying it in, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy but to save. Now, there's another scenario I want to talk to about is by the name of Joshua, who was one of the greatest leaders that ever was in the face of the planet. Moses was one an amazing leader. God rose him up to deliver the Israelites out of Egyptian slavery. They were in slavery for 430 years. God raised up from the midst of them a man by the name of Moses. God utilized Moses, and Moses, through his leadership and the anointing of God, was able to deliver God's people out of Egypt with a strong arm, with miracles and signs and wonders. And God brought him, brought them into to the desert, and he was going to use Moses to go to the promised land. But Moses had the anger of man. Moses got up so upset, he got angry at the people. And because he'd not shown reference to God, God says, you're not going to take him in there, but Joshua will. So God raises up Joshua. Joshua takes the Israelites over the Jordan River, and they're going to go into the land of Canaan. Now, the land of Canaan was a mess. God waited for enough time to go by. He waited like for 400 years for the Canaanites to turn back to God. They never did. They got worse and worse. God is very patient, slow to anger, and abounding in love. The God of the Old Testament is the same as the New Testament. He's slow to anger and bounding in love. And so he waited for over 400 years for these people to get their act together. They did not. It was so wicked. They were doing animal, a child sacrifice and all kinds of crazy things like that. All kinds of horrible things going on. Even geologists, I'm sorry, archaeologists will find it. What was going on in those days is pretty horrific. So they cross the, um, the Jordan River and they consecrate themselves. And Joshua is thinking, what are we going to do now? The first city they're going to attack would be Jericho, which had formidable walls. It's actually one of the most ancient city, I see the most ancient city in the world that we're knowing of, and we had a chance to go there as a church a number of years back. So there's Joshua, okay? He's taking stock of it. He's planning. He's praying. He's by himself. As a leader, it's good to do that. Get by yourself. Hear from God. And so this is what happens. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes, and he looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with a drawn sword in his hand, and Joshua went up to him and said to him, are you for us, or for your, are you for our adversaries? Now, that's a good question to ask. Here's a formidable soldier. I don't think he knew exactly who the person was yet, but he had a drawn sword. He was intimidating. He's like, uh, he probably had a little of this going on. He's like, uh-oh, this is the enemy. I'm in trouble. We're not quite sure exactly what happened, but he wanted to find out, hey, are you for us or for you, are you for our enemies? Well, you and I would say, are you a Democrat or a Republican? <laughs> are you God's party or the devil's party? Which one's which? I'm not going to tell you which one is because both of them got the devil in them. Let's just say that. So he's asking the question, which one are you of? I want to know. Are you on my side or their side, because after all, my side is right, their side is wrong. And he was absolutely correct, right? Because think about it. God said, I want you to take them out. I want you to correct what's going on in Canaan. You're going to be my instrument to bring judgment. So it's obvious, obviously, that God's will says I should go in there. And he asked the question, are you for us or are you for them? A good question to ask, right? Isn't that the same? Lord, should I be a Democrat or Republican? And what does God say? And he said, no. God's the, power, God's the power of no. He said, no, but I am of the commander of the army of Lord. Now I have come. In other words, I'm not with the Je people in Jericho, and I'm not with you. I'm with the armies of the Lord. So you and I need to be the same thing. You and I are not Republicans or Democrats. We're of the kingdom of heaven. We're different than that. We have to separate ourselves from the Republicans and the Democrats because neither party is the kingdom of heaven, guys. I hate to tell you. Jesus did not, was not on the cross with an American flag. He didn't carry his cross, and I'm proud to be an American. No, that's not what happened. Okay? He wasn't a Republican. He wasn't a Democrat. And sometimes we deify God and make him act like everything, you know, America is Jesus. No, it's not. 
Thank God we took some biblical principles and our country was founded on the belief of the God of the Bible, hands down. We'll talk about that next week. So he said, no, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. So God would say to us, I am not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. Step out from them. I want you to speak to them, but you're not to be of them. So let me just make that very clear. What has happened is we've identified with different parties. And I've heard people say this, if you're a Democrat, you can't be a Christian. I've heard this, if you're a Republican, you can't be a Christian. If you come next week, we'll deal with it. So what are you supposed to do with the whole thing? Well, I like what Abraham Lincoln said, sir, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is be on God's side, for God is always right. Abraham Lincoln, great president. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln had a very hard time. He had the North and the South. There was, a, there was an economic war going on, and it was also over slavery. And ironically enough, you know what he did in his, in his cabinet? He had both Democrats and Republicans together. He had adversary, adversaries in his cabinet because he wanted to listen to both sides. He had a fear of God. And he's one of the greatest politicians that ever was, a great leader, Abraham Lincoln. So are you on God's side or your side? You can't be both. Can't be both. You see, we're kingdom citizens. How we live out of faith in politics. Are we clear, everybody? We're not supposed to be Republican. Let me explain something to you. I'm not a Republican Christian or a Democrat Christian. I'm a Christian that might vote for some Republican candidates and some Democrat ideas Okay, I am first a kingdom of heaven. I am of Jesus Christ. I am not a Republican Christian. I might be a Christian that is a Republican or a Democrat or an independent. You follow me, everybody? Well, you guys are awfully quiet. Okay? And make no mistake about it, what we see going on in our culture today is business models. Multi, uh, companies want to get you to click on them. When they click on them, they can, they can sell your name for advertisers. If you watch cable news, they get money. Okay? And so this is what they do. A lot of us spend, because it's, it's like sports. We can spend three to four hours a day. Some people spend from seven to ten every night watching their favorite broadcast of news. Some people are scrolling all day long. What, now what's going on? Now what happened? We spend three to four hours a day reading things, looking at YouTube videos or speeches, memes, and all that, right? We spend 10 minutes reading the Bible, and we spend 15 hours a week looking at, looking at what's on the news. And we wonder which has influence upon us. Could it be we could probably switch that back to something else, right? So we're kingdom citizens, how we live in faith and politics. I like what Joshua said, and this is after what, what happened. And he said, no, I am the commander of the army of the Lord. It's the angel. Now I have come, and Joshua, what did he do? He fell on his face. What does that mean? He humbled himself. It's like, whoop, right? It's not about me. It's not about them. It's about God. He fell on his face to the earth and worshiped. What does it mean to worship? It means worship is putting God above it all. God, I worship you. I don't understand what's going on in our country. I don't understand what's going on in my marriage. I don't understand what's going on in my health. But Father, you're bigger and you're greater than my health. You're bigger and greater than my marital issues. You're bigger and greater than me trying to find a spouse. You're better, bigger and greater than me finding a job or finding people to hang out with. I'm lonely, whatever I'm going through. God, I worship you. You're better, you're, great, you're bigger. He fell on his face on the earth and he worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? We should say to God, God, I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. Father, I worship you. You're above all the political parties. You allow certain power to be there, by the way. That God's over everything. He gives freedom, but he goes over everything. He raises leaders and he, he stops leaders. So, Father, what is it you want me to do? That's the position we should be on. Not a Republican platform, not a Democratic platform. My platform is be on my face before the Lord and say, God, whatever you want, I will do. He fell on his face. He humbled himself. Okay? So, kingdom citizens, how do we live out of faith in politics? Submission to God above party. Remember, everybody, the tender of the kingdom of heaven is surrender. Tender is buying power. 
The buying power we have and the power of the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon our life is in direct proportion to our surrendering to God. I'm telling you right now, you want to be powerful? Surrender to your own will. Surrender to your own fears. and surrender. No, don't surrender your own fears. Surrender your fears and surrender to God. The problem is we surrender to our fears, right? Submission is to God above party. Joshua goes on, and the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. You see, you are an ambassador of heaven. We are not citizens of this earth. We're ambassadors of heaven. So wherever you go, you bring heaven with you. Jesus tells us to pray, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So where you are is holy ground. So are we treating the ground where we're walking as holy? Joshua got an understanding of that, just like Moses did. So, and then he told him what to do. Then he gave Joshua information how you're going to fight it, and it was completely different. He said to Joshua, don't open your mouth for seven days and march around it and pray and worship. And then God did a miracle. That's another story. So submission to God above party and humble ourselves before God. God is absolutely important. God resists the proud, but he gives what? Grace to the humble, okay? And the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and its mighty men. So what happened? He surrendered his will to God. He said, are you with us or them? Neither. I'm of the kingdom of heaven. Then what happened? Joshua said, okay, then I'm going to surrender and be under your leadership, God. It's not about my fight. It's not my fight. The battle belongs to who? If it's your battle, good luck. If it's God's battle, he fights for me. Amen? All right. So, and the Lord said to Joshua, amazing. So, submission to God above party, humble ourselves before God, and listen and obey to God's ways only. You cannot achieve kingdom principles by worldly means. If the means is against God's ethics, then it's wrong. It's very hard to be in politics because sometimes you have to twist the truth, which is basically lying, and say false things about your opponent. It's extremely difficult to be in politics because the way they play is dirty. They play dirty pool. So listen and obey God only. Now, in Acts 5.29, this is what Peter said because what happened was the government at the time said you cannot speak about Jesus. He says, whether we obey you or not, we must obey God rather than man. So Peter said to him, we must obey God rather than man. He was very respectful. So what happens is God has set all the authority above us, right? If the authority is asking me to disobey God, I have an obligation to obey God or, rather than that authority. Okay? I cannot do that in good conscience because I am a child of God, so I will not do I don't call them names. I just say, no, I cannot do that. And you use wisdom and strength. So I like what Rick Warren said. He said this, our primary allegiance is to the kingdom of God. We're not called to be Republican Christians or Democrat Christians, but kingdom Christians. Remember, guys, we are kingdom Christians. I like what President Ronald Reagan said. If we ever forget that we are one nation under God, then we will be a nation gone under. So listen, our country, I don't care what anyone tells you, it's not true. Our country was founded in the belief of the God of the Bible. But we purposely kept the church and the state separate from each other, which is smart, which I'll share with you in a few moments how that works and how it does not work. The Bible says, in, and, uh, blessed be the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Bible says godliness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to all people. So what are we to do? Well, this is what Jesus says. He says this, I have given them your word. He's praying for us, the church. It's Jesus praying before he went to be crucified. I have given them your word and the word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. 
He goes on to say this. I do not ask you that you take them out of the world. God's not calling us to be out of the world. We're supposed to what? But that you would keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. But Jesus says what? Go into all the world, but not be of the world. Be in the world, but not of it. I've used this illustration before. I can't think of a better one. If you think about it, you have mammals like you have whales and dolphins, right? They're mammals. And so they breathe, even though they're in the ocean, they breathe of a different atmosphere. They have to go to the top, blow out the, the toxic air, breathe in the good air, and go down. They're in the ocean, but not of it. They're not fish. Fish just are just cold-blooded. They just take whatever the temperature is at the moment. Sometimes us Christians, we transform from being mammals to fish, slimy fish that do whatever the culture says. When you give yourself to Christ, the Bible says you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. When you give your life to Christ, you turn from a fish to a mammal for this illustration. And we're different. We're, we're in the ocean, but we're not of the ocean. Are you following me, everybody? That's what Jesus says. You're in the world, but not of the world. We are to be ambassadors for Christ Jesus. Now, here's an illustration. I'm going to ask my friend Ruth to come out. How many like football? Ruth. I'm going to ask my friend Ruth to come out. There she is. Give it up for Ruth. All right. So in the, in the game of football, you have, you have a bunch of teams, right? And you pray for each team. I like the New York Giants. So let's suppose the Giants are playing the Patriots. Now, what happens is this. We have two teams, and then you have another team. It's called the team of the referees. And the referee's job is to take the NFL playbook, and if I grab a guy's helmet, uh, I'm sorry, you throw a flag on the field, that's wrong, that's a penalty. And so the referee is not rooting for either team, but the referee gives instruction to each team and speaks to each team. If the referee begins to like a different team over the other one, it's no longer a referee. Do you follow me, everybody? So our job is to be like referees in some ways. We're not of the same team of the world. We are to be different than the world. I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I am a kingdocrat. And so my job is, what does the Bible say? For example, if someone's struggling in their marriage, what does the Bible say about, um, about that? If someone's struggling with, their, with, with depression, and all, what happens? We look in the Bible, and whatever the Bible says, we align to that. So Art, what are you doing? Wait a minute. You're supposed to be impartial. So now what happened now? She just put a team jersey on over her referee. Thank you so much. Give it up for her, will you please? So the problem, we have done the same thing. We are different. Our rule book is different. We should speak to the Republicans, speak to the Democrats, speak to the independents, and declare the word of the Lord. When they're right, we say it's right. Now, you may like a certain team more than the other, but if you're a referee, you're not part of that team. If you're a Christian, you're not a Republican, you're not a Democrat, you're a kingdom person. What does the book say? If what they're doing and what, they're, if what their policies are are against the book, it's a problem. And we should speak to it outside of being a part of that team. You may say, you know what? This team is correct. Does that make sense, everybody? Sometimes you have to go back to, that. sometimes what the referees do, they have to put their headphones on and speak to the higher authority to look at the play, right? So what you and I should do, Lord Jesus, I don't know what to do with this one. And they converse with each other. This is what we're supposed to do as well. You see, like what Chuck Colson said, not Colton, Chuck Colson said this, the church does not belong to the state, nor does the state belong to the church. The church belongs to Christ and must speak prophetically to the state, regardless of which political power is in control. Don't turn a blind eye to what your party is doing. You may like some of its economic policies, but some of its social policies. We'll get into that next week. So what are we supposed to do? We should submission to God above party. We should be praying. The Bible says, first of all, I urge you by supplications and prayers, therefore intercessions, intercessions and thanksgivings, be thankful for our country. We could be in Haiti. You could be in North Korea. You could be in Iran right now. You could be in Venezuela. 
You can be in other places in the world right now. You don't have the freedoms. You have. Thank God for the freedom. Thank you, God, for the leaders I do have. Right? Come on. So what are we supposed to do? You should I should pray first. Pray for our leaders that it may go well with us. If President Biden and Kamala Harris do a good job, it helps us. Okay, whoever's going to be in the White House. So, for, and by the way, it's God's more interested in the church house than the White House. You can't change the White House without first changing your house and the church house. We have to get the church house correct before we start talking about the White House. We still involve with that. Okay, so Thanksgiving for all pe- made for all people. For what? That we may lead peaceful and quiet lives. This is God's will. He wants us to have that will in our lives. So this is what happens. For there is what? One God, and there is one mediator between Christ Jesus and men, the men Christ. Our allegiance is to Almighty God. We want all men to be saved. And our allegiance is to pray for those in authority over us. Pray for them. That's what we're going to do. So submission, a, a, a pray, and get the truth. Be informed. It's very hard to be informed right now. I used to like, I, during church, I used to use my TiVo, and I don't know what they call it now, uh, not Tim Tebow, but TiVo. We like him too, by the way. Anyhow, so I used to love this program called Meet the Press with Tim Russert. I love Tim Russert. I know he used to work for Tip O'Neill, who was a Democrat, but he was fair. He asked good questions. He showed clips. He was an equal opportunity. He went to both parties, and it was decent journalism. Remember Walter Cronkite? I'm dating myself. Now, forget about it. They, they, they lie. They, they spin. All, all the sides spin. It's hard to get the truth, and we're going to help you next week, hopefully give you some sources so you can make an informed decisions about which party it is. For example, I I won't get into that next week. So get the truth. Be informed. I love that. I was reading Isaiah this past week, and this is what Isaiah had to say. I love it. Listen to this. Don't call everything a what? Now, we don't have that going on today, do we, everybody? You know we didn't land on the moon. It's all made up. I'm joking. Don't call everything a conspiracy like they do. And don't live in dread of what frightens them. The world's not going to go to hell if Donald Trump gets it or Kamala Harris gets it. It's going to be fine. God's still on the throne. Hello. It's an existential crisis. We're going to blow up. No, you're not going to blow up. You'll be fine. Just grow up. Don't blow up. Okay? And don't live in dread of what frightens them. Make the Lord of heaven's armies holy in your life. Hello. He is the one you should fear. Hello. He is the one who should make you tremble, not the Republican Party, not the Democratic Party, not Putin, not Xi. Okay? Very clear. The Bible says that. So submission to God above party, pray, get the truth, be informed, vote. Steward the talents that you have. I don't have time to get into it right now, but we live in an amazing culture, a um, a representative form of government, right? We're a democrat. We're a democratic republic, and so we have rights. We can vote. You can run for school council. You can be elected in your local place. You can write letters. We're going to be talking about some things they're trying to do in our state right now. We'll hear more about that next week. And so Jesus talks about the talents, right? And if you heard the story of the talents, which to save time, he gave one, um, one talent, another two, another five. One guy with one talent buried it, didn't use his talent. The other one multiplied it, doubled it. The other guy multiplied it. Christ came back and gave an account for what they were to do. God has given us the talent of representative form of government where you and I can vote. You and I can be a part of the pro- process. You and I can speak to have our message heard. This is what Jesus says to the person who did not use our talent. This is what he said. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten. For everyone who has will more be given, and he who will have an abundance, but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. If you and I do not exercise the right to vote, according to what I heard, I don't know if it's true or not, but I heard about 40% of Bible-believing Christians are only registered to vote. Only 40%. We should all be registered to vote. Okay? 
So we have a right, we have a talent. When the apostle Paul was whipped and beaten, when he was beaten, and they found out he was a Roman citizen, they said, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Apostle Paul, go ahead and go. No, 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 no. Uh-uh. I'm not leaving until the officials come down here and speak to us in person. The Apostle Paul was bold in his Roman citizenship, so should we. If your rights or the rights of somebody else is being trampled, we have a responsibility to stand up for it in dignity and truth. So the Apostle Paul said, ah, no, no, no. They're going to come down here. And they came down. Oh, we're so sorry. Yeah, you should be. Then later on, he was being accused of things. He said this, I appeal to Caesar. So the Apostle Paul used the Roman citizenship to the utmost to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, the Apostle Paul was a Roman citizen even though he was Jewish. You and I are believers in Christ, but we may be citizens of the United States. We should use the talent of being a citizen to its utmost. You and I have a civic responsibility to be salt and light as believers of God. We should pray. We should vote, and we should get involved, but different than the world. Amen? Okay, we're going to have to end. I'm going to act act locally and nationally and think globally. I want to say this. This is what you are, but you are a chosen race. I'm not a a German-American. No, that's not what I am. I'm not a German and Italian-American. That's not what I am. I am a believer in Christ that's an American. My identity is not in my race. My identity is in Jesus Christ. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy... Uh Uh-huh. We have our own nation. A people for his own possession that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. There's two different verses there. I want to ask you a question. How are you with God today? Are you identifying more with the political party than you are the kingdom of heaven? It's time to change. Let's separate ourselves from the world and let us submit to Jesus Christ. He is king of all. Amen? Let's bow our heads. Father, I just thank you so much for today, and I thank you for the opportunity today, Lord, to look at your word and see what you have to say about the kingdom. Lord, I ask in Jesus' name that we be a people, that, Lord, we would not be Republican, we would not be Democrat, but we would be kingdom independents. Father, that we would divorce ourselves from each party and be like a referee who puts the stripes on, for by your stripes we're healed. We're striped ones. And Father, that we would speak to the Republicans, speak to the Democrats, and we'd be godly citizens to make a difference in Jesus' name. Father, I pray for unity in this church. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that all the vitriol and the sickness that's in our culture would get off of our church and that we'd be godly citizens, godly men and women in Jesus' name. Thank you.